Okay, long overdue, I'm finally putting together my introduction to my online role-playing English class. Uh, we're going to walk through how you can play the game online. Um, I've chosen an adventure that uh, is, the story should be a little bit familiar, <laughs> uh, but it should be a lot of fun. Now. To me, the funnest part of role-playing games is that the story, even though you have a base story to work with, the story has unlimited possibilities. So today is just one example. Uh, when I actually do this class with students in the future, the outcomes will be completely different. So let's go into the app and take a look. The long-awaited demo of how Roll 20 words in teaching uh, my role playing English class. Um, now, schools are going to be closed for quite a bit longer. Um, and I know a lot of parents are getting frustrated, uh, maybe even bored with some of the way their kids are being educated. And I know that it's going to be a little while before people start to understand what I'm doing here. Um, but let me at least demo today what is possible and show you one possible outcome of the story because that's the funnest thing about this is any outcome is possible. We have a guideline. You'll recognize parts of the story from Alice in Wonderland, but that is just the basis. The fun thing about role-playing games is that you your options are unlimited it's not like some computer game where you're just limited to the programming the program script that's before you the long-awaited demo of how roll 20 works in teaching uh, my role-playing english class um, now schools are going to be closed for quite a bit longer um, and I know a lot of parents are getting frustrated, uh, maybe even bored with some of the way their kids are being educated. And I know that it's going to be a little while before people start to understand what I'm doing here. Um, but let me at least demo today what is possible and show you one possible outcome of the story. Because that's the funnest thing about this is any outcome is possible. We have a guideline. You'll recognize parts of the story from Alice in Wonderland, but that is just the basis. The fun thing about role-playing games is that you your options are unlimited. It's not like some computer game where you're just limited to the programming, the program script that's before you. So today I'm gonna to be playing the Dungeon Master, the teacher. I'm also going to be trying to play my four characters. So let me introduce them to you. First, we have Paul Hoiming. She is our human scholar. Now, I've adapted the game a little bit um, to make it easier to learn and to have a nice Chinese twist to it. So my four base classes are not what you'll typically see in Dungeons and Dragons. A little bit different, okay. Uh, but she's a scholar, so that means she's going to be like your average magic using class in Dungeons and Dragons, so her intelligence is very important. And so she, I gave her some skills. We, there will be some examples of that in the gameplay. I'm trying to make that portion of the game very simple to begin with, because um, I don't want students to be worried about the rules of the game um, and not be able to play. I want them to be able to jump in and pretend to be their character, start listening to the English and thinking about how they can reply and use that English in English. I don't want them translating in their heads 
And, and that's one of the great things about role-playing game is it happens fast and we don't have time for translation. So we've given her a dagger and she has a basic spell. So that's all I mean. Now, the next one we have is, oops, we want to click on him here to see his bio and info. This is Bon Dahoy. <laughs> and he is a halfling rascal. Now, this is my version of the rogue class. Um, and it's based upon the idea of people who are on the outside of normal society. So they don't follow all the rules that everybody else follows, and that's why they're called rascals. Okay, but as a halfling, or um, this is the uh, uh, another way of saying hobbit, but they couldn't use hobbit, of course, for copyright reasons. So his dexterity is going to be very important, and that he just happened to I rolled these character stats. Sometimes they can use the standard array. I actually rolled them um, using this app, uh, using roll 20. So he's got some skills like acrobatics, um, deception, very important for surviving on the street. And I've also given these characters uh, a little bit of personality. Uh, that's very important in developing your character, is giving them a little background, giving them some good and some bad traits, because that way you can explore more with them um, and, and have a lot more fun playing them. You know, if everyone's just perfect, ever, uh, it'll get boring real quick. I mean, even Superman has his kryptonite weakness. Okay, next we have our Dwarf Novice. Now, this is my equivalent of the uh, cleric or priest class. Um, and I initially called them initiate, uh, but I found that some of my students were having problems with that name. So I changed it to novice, um, but it makes sense with what they will grow into um, at third level. Okay, now their wisdom is pretty important. He did not roll as high in wisdom as the other two characters did, but that's okay. Not all characters are, you know, really superheroes. Huh? Um, my next video in Cantonese on how to play Dungeons and Dragons uh, will go into this a little bit more, but these statistics are based on an average person being about 10 to 11 in all of these. And, you know, sometimes they're less, sometimes they're more. And that just determines on when we make 20-sided dice rolls to determine success or failure in certain situations, what bonuses they get. So it's one of the mechanics of the game playing itself. Now, he has skills like insight. That means his intuition about um, how people are acting around him, uh, perception, again, uh, similar but not quite exact same skills um, and then also because this class is typically the healer class so I gave him proficiency in medicine okay and then he has his wooden sword uh, I thought of making this uh, a variation on as they grow into like Dallas priests is one of the options when they get to level three so they cannot use metal weapons. Um, just like in the original Dungeons and Dragons cleric, they could not use bladed weapons. They could only use blunt weapons. Okay, so that's Maki-san. All right, and our last character is our fighter of the group, Songmei, and she's an elf warrior. Now. When I made these characters, I actually rolled them randomly, but uh, it just happens that in uh, one of my classes, we have also one of my students who is an elf warrior. Um, and, and it's really fun because she set the background as, as someone being very shy and reserved, but yet when she needs to fight, she, she kicks butt. Okay, so, and I made her 
warriors can go two ways. They can go strength-based or dexterity-based. I made her dexterity-based with the idea that um, players uh, with this with different fighting styles. So thinking more in the lines of a martial arts-based fighting style, I would claim I would call that more dexterity-based, and so that's not just someone who goes and bashes things, you know, like a tank. Um, so that's why I made her dexterity high when we went through her roles. And besides, as an elf, she gets a bonus in dexterity. So that was very easy to get her high and then her constitution to make sure she's super healthy. Um, and I added her charisma um, to make her kind of a leader of the party. Okay. Now, she is skilled with athletics and we may see that come into the game today. Um, intimidation, if she needs to get her way, she can um, scare people into getting what she wants. Um, and also perception so that she notices things because she's been trained as a soldier. And that was something that I kind of wrote into her background story, which I won't go into full details on in this video. But uh, just to let you know that I did put that thought into making the character when I made it. Okay, so let's jump into the story. With the river floating lazily by, the clouds floating sluggishly overhead, and the smell of flowers drifting on the breeze, today is the perfect do-nothing summer day. Even the animals seemed to agree. Not far away, a white rabbit in a blue waistcoat runs by. It stops and takes a watch out of its waistcoat pocket and checks the time, muttering to itself, Oh dear, oh dear, we shall be too late. We must all hurry. The rabbit jumps and leaps away into the nearby wood as if the waistcoat and watch and talking weren't strange enough. The rabbit vanishes at the beginning of each leap, only to reappear again on the other side. So that was the beginning of an adventure. My job as a dungeon master, as a teacher, I tell the players what they see, and then I ask them what they want to do. Now, for the sake of time um, uh, and to save myself a little bit of extra role playing, <laughs> uh, I'm just going to assume without getting in too much trouble that my players are going to follow the rabbit. Because of their different personalities, I could have done, I could have done that in very different ways. Uh, but, you know, I, I want to get quickly to the fun parts of playing the game. Um, and save some of the imagination for the players when they come in to play the game. So they follow the rabbit and he runs through the woods and this wood should be familiar, but somehow it has changed. Trees have grown closer together, making it, making it impossible to pass between them and the calls of wild birds and animals echo louder than ever before. It would all be frightening if not for the wide path to follow and all the bright colors. Beautiful but strange flowers and mushrooms have blossomed and sprouted everywhere, decorating the trees and path in a rainbow of wonder. From somewhere up ahead on the path, the white rabbit can be heard crying out Oh dear, oh dear, we must hurry, late, late, late. Now, we've really caught our four adventurers' attention and they're going to follow even further into the woods. Now, that's where they start on this board that you see here, kind of like a board game, not always the way Dungeons and Dragons is played. Uh, but the purpose of this adventure is to get the students to help make the transition from 
board games that they may be used to playing and more of an open Dungeons and Dragons feel. So we're going to now do a Dungeons and Dragons type feature, which is they're going to roll initiative to see the order that they take their turns in. Now this is based upon 20 sided dice rolls and they get to add a bonus based upon their dexterity bonus. Okay, so here is the order that has been rolled and we see that Maki-san goes first and we get notification here that it's his turn. We're going to roll a six-sided dice. And our initiative tracker covered that up. We got a four. So we're going to move him four spaces on the board. Oops, we just want one. One, two, three, four. All right, nothing happens on that spot. So Maki's done, we mark done, and next we're going to song or song, and we're going to. Now, there's an, one way to roll that I just did was to type it in. Another way that we can roll is to use this menu on the side here. Okay, she rolls a two. So we'll move her two spots as they start through the forest following the rabbit. Okay, now I like using this way faster. On gets a six, wow, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so far none of them have landed on any of the challenge squares, but that's all right. We still have quite a ways to go, so let's go through the board, see where Ha Siujie is going, Miss Ho. She rolls a five, all right, that means she's gonna land here on a potential shortcut. But this is where, instead of just saying you got a shortcut, this is when we add some story elements. So, Ms. O, as you walk through the forest, you think you may see a shortcut through the woods. Please make a perception check. So, you can open up her character and we click on perception. Now, she has to beat a certain number in this check to succeed. And I don't tell the players the result all of the time. Sometimes I'll let them know what they're aiming for. Sometimes just to keep it exciting, I keep it a secret. But for now, let's just see what she rolls. It's a normal roll. She rolls very high. Dirty 20, we call that. And so she sees a shortcut. And as she goes through the shortcut, she finds that she is not alone. To make it through the shortcut, we're gonna jump into a random monster encounter. Now this is something that was an optional idea for this module. Uh, but I thought it would be fun to show you some of the combat encounters as well, just to show you what we can do with this game. Now, I'm going to make this a GM role because I normally I wouldn't let the players see what I'm rolling. Of course, right now we're making this video from the GM screen, the, the Dungeon Master screen, so you get to see everything. But normally the students would not see us. As you walk through the shortcut, suddenly from the woods jumps out a giant mastiff. Prepare to defend yourself. I didn't fill in all the stats for these um, because I'm, I'm actually still learning some of the 
uh, techniques of this app myself. <laughs> uh, it's something you takes a, a lot of experience with. But uh, so here we are. She is going to fight. I have prepared my characters. So she will come down. As she is a scholar, she has two options in her attack. She can either use her dagger or she can cast a spell. And let's say that she casts her spell. So Miss Ho says, mm, I'm going to take him out quickly. I'm going to cast Ray of Frost. Let's see what happens. A natural 20. Oh, that's a great way. Now, this is a rule that is primarily for combat. Some players like to use it in ability checks as well, but um, I think it makes sense to keep it just for combat. When you roll a natural 20 in an attack roll, this is what we just made, an attack roll. A natural 20 means an automatic hit and you get to do double the damage. Her normal damage would be 1d8 we've written here. So double that would be 2d8. So we're going to roll it times two for a total of 10 points of damage. And that defeats Thompson. So we'll just make him disappear. <laughs> and so you defeat the Mastiff and successfully pass through the shortcut. Congratulations. All right, she's done with her turn. Moving on. Round two, Maki-san is back again. Now you may be wondering why the dwarf has a Japanese name. Okay, uh, some people might remember some of the racial slurs of the past, and I promise that's not what I had in mind. I was actually thinking of the Ainu people um, and their myths and legends in Japan of their dwarf-like people. Um, so that's why uh, you'll see dwarfs in my world have Japanese names. Um, in fact, I have uh, different names for the different races. So uh, humans have Cantonese names. Um, actually, the elves have uh, Mandarin names and the halflings have Hakka names. <laughs> As this is a, again part of my world building trying to make a Chinese theme. Different races have their different language and to make it more fun and interesting I chose existing Chinese languages for each culture. Okay so anyway back to Maki-san's roll. So we're going to roll d6 to get him through there. Okay, he rolls two, so he's up here with Fong, and he's done with his turn. Song roll d6. Again, she gets a two. Okay, we're done with her. Okay, we land on a save challenge. I have a list of potential things that could happen to the player at this point. So I am going to make a secret D6 roll to see which things happened on my list. All right, Bong, you see some yummy looking berries on the tree. You're not sure if these are edible or you'll get sick. Make an intelligence check to see if you know the difference. So we go to his character sheet and we make an intelligence saving throw. So intelligence saving throw. Now he doesn't have a check mark here because that is not a saving throw that his class, his profession is especially good at. So let's take a roll and see what happens. A natural one. You take a look at the berries and you think mm, they should be okay. 
And so you take one and you eat it. It doesn't take long at all for you to start feeling a pain in your stomach. Because he failed this intelligence check and he ate a berry that was bad for him, we're going to make a constitution check to see just how bad that damage was. So let's open his character sheet back up. Now a constitution check is something that he is proficient with. So his odds should be a little bit better. Okay, luckily, even though the berries taste pretty bad and you just spit them out right away, uh, you realize, oh, that was not a good berry. And you feel very fortunate that due to your healthy constitution, nothing bad happened to you before you were able to swallow that berry. No food poisoning today. <laughs> okay, that's the end of Fong's turn. Moving on, Miss Ho's turn, and she's way ahead of the group here, thanks to that shortcut. All right, so she's gonna move three spaces. Okay, that's the end of her turn. Maki-san's turn. Ooh, good roll. Let's see where he ends up. One, two, three, four, five, six. He gets, he gets a magical challenge. These challenges are only available to our two classes that have magical abilities. And that is Maki because he is a novice, so he has holy magic. And Misong, who has the scholarly magic, this is what he sees. A perfectly round stone carved with mystic spirals has been set into the middle of the path. Magic power radiates from it. Let's see if he knows how to make this magic work. Now, because he's the healer class, and there's not a skill um, that's directly related to the healing class, uh, like for the magic users, the scholars, they have their arcana, which is they know about old ancient magic. Um, so I tied this to his medicine check because he's a healer. So let's see, he makes his magic check. He knows exactly the right words to say to make the magical stone work and you get to move forward to the next magical spot. Congratulations. All right, moving along in the end of the line, Miss Song. One, two, three. Oh, she gets a saving throw challenge. So once again, let's see. Ah, we got the same result as Fong did. So you also see berries that you think may be good for you. Now, you didn't see what Fong did when he came on this square. So you need to also make a check to see if you know if these berries are edible or not. Now, she's our fighter. She may not be the strongest one in the group, uh, but luckily she is fast and she's healthy. But let's see if she passes her intelligence check. You look at that berry and you recognize from your time growing up in the woods with your elven family that that berry is not one that you should be eating. And for your wise decision, you get to move one to four spaces forward. So, little d4. And she gets it. She gets to move three spaces forward. Moving on. Fong, who has just been passed up. Let's see how far he can go. He rolls a three, so he's on the same square with Miss Sung. Moving up to the head of the pack, Miss Ho. That's another thing that I can do to 
Make the next turn. Two. All right, she was here. So one, two is going to put her on a skill challenge. She is especially skilled in investigation. So if she can pass this investigation check, she gets to take another turn. So let's give her a, a situation. Looking through the woods, you think that you can find a way to help you move just a little bit further, get just a little bit more energy. Make an investigation check and look into your surroundings. There are some little berries on the side of the road. You know that they're good for you. These ones give you just a little bit extra energy to take another turn. Congratulations. All right, she's gonna move another four squares. One, two, three, four. Okay, we have another save challenge. All of a sudden, a huge hawk swoops down in the air and tries to bite at you. Make a dexterity save to see if you can jump out of the way. Now, Miss Ho is our scholar. Uh, she has a fairly good dexterity. Let's see what she rolls. She's not proficient in it. She successfully jumps out of the way, making a tumble and moving another two spaces. Wow, what a big turn for Miss Ho. <laughs> okay, very good. All right, round four. Maki-san, make your roll. Oh, only a one. All right, that's all he can do for that turn. Okay, Miss Song. One, two, three. Okay, and Fong lands on a magical challenge. However, he is not skilled in the ways of magic, so this gives him no benefit at all. Back to Miss Ho, who is way ahead of the others now. Let's see what happens next. Okay, nothing special for her turn. All right, round five. Save challenge. All of a sudden, you start to feel your tummy grumble. You are very hungry. Can you continue on despite your hunger? Well, that's going to be a constitution check to see if he can continue. Oh, the grumbling in your stomach is just more that you can bear. All right, Nisong. Four, okay, she's done. One, one, two, oh. Fong, you think you might see a shortcut. Make a perception check. Now this time, we all see on the board, we know what's going on, but sometimes in the game, the dungeon master will ask for a perception check before he gives, divulges any information. But here on the board, we know what could potentially happen. He notices the shortcut. And as he travels part way through, Suddenly, a kobold jumps out and attacks you. Defend yourself. Okay, let's see what Fong has. Now, he could either use a dagger or a short bow. We're going to say, in this case, 
that the kobold runs right up and is right next to him. So he has to use his melee, his hand-to-hand -hand combat, which is his dagger. So he makes his attack roll to see if he hits. And his first hit misses. You swing your dagger at the kobold and it dashes out of the way, dodging your blade. Then, and the kobold gets plus four on his attack, which I forgot to add, but that's okay. So his total roll is an eight. And if we look at Fong Ho, his armor class is 16. So the Cobalt would have had to roll a 16 or better to hit him because he has very high dexterity and he's wearing leather armor. So that's his, uh, but Fong, you are also very quick and you are able to dodge out of the way of the Cobalt's attack. It is your turn to attack again. So we'll go back and see. Actually, let's, let's go here. Reuse that so that we don't have to open up the player sheet. All right, this time your attack hits. And I do have to look at potential damage that he can do. All right, that dagger can do 1d6 damage. Your dagger goes right into the stomach of the kobold and he falls down. Congratulations. You can move through the shortcut, putting you way ahead of Mackie and Sung, but Miss Ho is still way ahead of you. <laughs> All right, Miss Ho, make your turn. Okay. She is going to move two spaces up to Magic Challenge. So once again, Miss Ho, you notice a magical stone with strange markings on the ground. You pick it up. It seems familiar to you. Make an Arcana check. You understand the workings of this stone. You say the magic words and you jump forward. There is not another magic square ahead. So we're just going to give her another turn. All right, she's going to move one, two, three spaces forward. Okay, good job. Round six. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six. Ah, uh, and once again, he is not skilled in the ways of magic. He is unable to use that. Too bad. She is just cruising through this board. To what? We don't know, but she is just about through this path following the rabbit. And our warrior is not skilled in the ways of magic. She's unable to take advantage of the magic stone. Moving on. Miss Ho, you're coming up. Miss Ho, you are coming up on clearing what lies ahead. Round eight. Maki san, make a perception check. Unfortunately, you notice nothing special. Continue along the normal path ahead of you.
All right. Our brave Miss Sohn, even though it's been slow going on the pass, you feel that you may have a second wind coming. Make an athletics check to see if you can take another turn. Now, this is her one of her special skills, something that she is proficient in. But she is just still moving too slow through this forest. She's unable to catch her breath and move on forward. Oh well. All right, Fong. One, two, okay. Next. Oh, I think we're just about there. Okay. Okay. This large clearing would seem peaceful if it weren't for the vine-covered tree at the center. The vines move and twitch too often to be ju just swaying in the breeze. The white rabbit stops at the base of the tree. It reaches a paw into its waistcoat pocket, but before it can pull out its watch, several vines snap down and wrap around it. The vines pull the poor white rabbit up into the air as it calls out, Let me go! Let me go! We're all late! Let me go! The tree before you comes to life. And you must now fight the Tangle Me Tree. Okay, now this was a surprise. So, the Tangle Me Tree is going to attack Miss Ho first. So we know that she has a 12 armor class. So the Tangle Me Tree makes its attack roll. The vines whip around you and pull you in, causing you, let's see how much damage it does. Six points of damage. Oh, that was a pretty serious injury as the Tangle Me Tree pulls you up behind and you are unable to move. Now that the rabbit and our first hero have reached the tree, our other heroes are magically transported up into the clearing and can take their actions. So let's move them up here now. And then we'll go back in the initiative order. And I didn't put the Tangle Me Tree on. I could have done that um, on the initiative tracker, but we're going to keep this pretty simple uh, just for the sake of the story and, and explaining what's going on. Okay, so let's see that our heroes are in this order. That way, Fong can use his bow. Okay, so we'll remember that the Tangle Me Tree comes after Miss Ho. All right, Aki-san's turn. He comes forward and he sees that Miss Ho has been seriously injured. So he casts his healing spell on her, which can do light healing. Okay, he has a light healing spell and we'll say for the sake of time that that can do 1d6 healing so he heals miss ho for for one hit point moving her up to three all right next our fighter song i rush up and fight that mean tree. I take my long sword, which I put it as Jian or Hibaki. <laughs> and she has a pretty decent attack bonus and she can do D8 in damage if it hits. So let's do her attack roll first. And just double check. All right, that's his armor class. And your attack hits. 
Roll for damage. Now I'm sort of do. She does seven points of damage to to the tangle me tree. You leap forward with your sword, and in one slash, you take a huge cut of the vine that was holding Miss Ho. So that was enough to free her for her next turn. Congratulations. All right, it's my turn. I'm going to use my shirt bow and shoot at that mean old tree. Another solid hit. Roll for damage. Your arrow finds its way right to the heart of the tree. The tangled meat tree falls. Congratulations, you have defeated the tree. Now, after you've freed the rabbit, Miss Ho, who was the first to arrive, will receive an, a fully charged wand of magic missiles. And all of our characters will receive an experience point. In normal Dungeons and Dragons, the experience points um, are received from defeating monsters or facing certain challenges. Um, and they go on a number. Now, I have adopted a milestone base because I don't want the characters, the students, to just be fighting monsters all the time. I want them to be solving problems as well. So after each mission, I give one experience point, and so it would take eight experience points to get to the second level. And I have a table for that in my World Anvil page um, where I've detailed how that all works. So, um, Miss Ho, being first, gets her, gets that treasure, and free from the Tangle Me Tree's clutches, the White Rabbit takes a moment to dust off its waistcoat before checking the time on its watch. Oh my, we're late! Come here, I must reward you. Yes, hello, hello. Thank you for saving me. The Right Rabbit waits for all the members to come close to them and he hands them a backpack left by some adventure from the past. Inside there are two potions of healing and a slice of cake wrapped up in wax paper with a note that reads, eat me later. You put these in your pocket to see what happens in our next adventure, because just as you put it in your pocket, the rabbit pulls you through a magic portal. And we'll see you in the next episode. All right, I hope you liked that sample. Um, I'm looking forward to working with this class. This Roll20 format is going to be available for my adult class and my children's class. Um, the demo today was more based on what the children will go through, but I do have it for my adult class as well. And I will be starting both of those classes as soon as I get three or four students enrolled. Um, so look out on my page for uh, enrollment and tuition costs and all those details. In the meantime, if you're seeing this video after the class has already started, Feel free to check it out. If you like what you saw, be sure to give it a like and subscribe for more upcoming videos on how to improve your English by playing role-playing in Dungeons and Dragons. See y'all later.